Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph Sassine. I'm a professor here at the University of Colorado Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And this is Dr. Joel Mars. He's an assistant professor here at the university also. We're gonna go through the manual method for measuring blood pressure. The first thing that you may be asking yourself is, what is blood pressure? And blood pressure is basically a physiologic function of the pressure in our arteries, both when our heart is contracting and relaxing. Specifically, the two numbers that are important to note are the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. The systolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the heart is um, in contraction, and the diastolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the heart is relaxing. In general, a good systolic and diastolic blood pressure is one that's less than 140 over 90. It is optimal to have, though, a little stricter number, if possible, of less than 120 over 80. The first step is to select your equipment and do a visual inspection. So typically when we're measuring blood pressure manually, we need a stethoscope and also a blood pressure cuff with a manometer. So the first visual check just should be make sure that there's no leaks in the tubing related to either the stethoscope or the blood pressure cuff. A very important step is to make sure that your patient is relaxed and in an appropriate period of rest before measurement. So you want to sort of set some reassurance that the measurement of blood pressure is not going to cause any pain and that it should be relatively easy and quick to do. Secondly, you also want your patient in that ideal period of rest, which really is five minutes in the position in which you're gonna measure blood pressure with the back supported and the feet firmly on the ground. So we can see that Dr. Mars is in the ideal situation where he is seated, his back is supported, his arm is just about ready and his feet are on the floor firmly. Also important as part of that five minute period of rest is to also make sure that the patient hasn't ingested caffeine or smoked ideally within the past 30 minutes, but at least within the past five. Now we have our patient and next we have to prepare his arm. It's an ideal position where we routinely measure blood pressure in the seated positions. We're gonna to have to place this cuff on that upper bicep. It is recommended for the most accurate measurement that the cuff be directly placed on a bare arm. Prior to this patient's five minute period of rest, I had him remove his shirt and just sit with an undershirt on. Now that we have our patient rested for a period of five minutes, I can place this on his upper arm, on his bicep, and place the head of my stethoscope on bare skin. This here is a standard adult size cuff. There's two ways to determine whether the blood pressure cuff is properly sized. One, you can actually measure the circumference of the patient's arm, and if that size fits into the reference range of the blood pressure cuff, this one for a normal adult is in centimeters 25.4 to 40.6, so we can simply measure the arm, or we can place the cuff on the patient's arm and make sure that the white index bar falls into the reference range. The next step is actually getting prepared to listen for the systolic blood pressure is to inflate the cuff. And you can do one of two things to estimate where to start inflating the cuff. One is to pump up the pressure 30 millimeters per mercury higher than the patient's average systolic blood pressure, or you can estimate what the patient's systolic blood pressure is by using the palpatory method. The palpatory method is rather simple. Basically, what you have to do with one hand, you would control pumping up the pressure in the manometer, and the other hand into the cuff, and with the other hand, you would use your yep. pointer finger and your middle finger to palpate the patient's radial pulse. So once you've palpated a patient's radial pulse, you close the valve on your inflation device and you increase to approximately 70 millimeters of mercury. If it's 70 millimeters of mercury, you still feel a pulse, you go up to 80. Then you go up to 90. You go up in increments of 10 until you stop palpating a radial pulse. In this patient, I stop palpating a radial pulse right at about 130. That gives me an objective estimation of where to start blood pressure measurement in this patient. So it would estimate that a systolic is approximately 130. I will start listening for sounds at a pressure of 160, 30, to add, 30 added on to that 130. So I'll take my stethoscope and I'll place it properly into my ear canal. You notice with most stethoscopes that your pieces are slightly bent, slightly downward, and maybe an angle of about 20 or 30 degrees. And then you place it into your ear canal with the angle away from your face. So I have the cuff, the properly sized cuff placed on his arm. I have the head of the stethoscope with the bell attached to the skin or touching the skin. And I'm going to close the valve on my inflation device. And I'm going to pump this up to 160. Ideally, you want the rate of deflation 
to be approximately two to four millimeters of mercury per second. The reason to deflate slowly is so you really can listen for sounds. If you notice, this deflation is at a very slow rate. But I'm going slow because what I'm trying to notice is the first time I hear a sound, a sound called Krakow sounds. The, at the point at which I hear the first Krakow sound, which right now is about 130, that's this patient's systolic blood pressure. I'm still listening, I'm hearing sounds. And the point at which I stop hearing sounds, stop hearing those Krakow sounds, is the patient's diastolic blood pressure. I'm still hearing sounds, even though it's deflating slowly at about two to four millimeters of mercury per second. I still hear sounds in this patient. And right about now, I don't hear any more. I'm gonna let it still go down slowly for about another 10 millimeters of mercury. And at that point, I open up the valve completely to let it completely deflate. So I mentioned the appearance of Krakow sounds and the disappearance of Krakow sounds. Krakow sounds change throughout the blood pressure cycle. So when I measured blood pressure in Dr. Mars, I first heard, heard sounds at 130. That's the systolic blood pressure. But as I heard the sounds, they were um, a tapping sound that turned into a thud sound that turned into a more muffled sound and then finally disappeared. So they first present as tapping sounds that get a little bit louder and then they start to go away and then they subtly fade away. Those Krakow sounds actually have five phases with four unique sounds. That's the reason to listen with the bell if possible when hearing for those, hearing and listening for those Krakow sounds because there's a, a difference in the nature of how they pan out. And it really is sometimes challenging to hear the first sound because it comes in soft and tapping. So you have to be very diligent and in a quiet environment to listen most proficiently. So the proper blood pressure measurement for this patient today was 130 over 80. That's considered an acceptable blood pressure value since it's less than, less than the general goal of less than 140 over 90, which applies for most patients. The last step is that I should document correctly the blood pressure value that I just measured. So on the Million Hearts website, they do make diaries available. And it is very important to write down if you don't have a diary available, it's acceptable to write on another piece of paper, but it's important to document the date, the time, the location. So the most common reasons for a false blood pressure measurement are not having that five minute period of rest. And you can imagine when blood pressure is measured in a medical office or as a pharmacist, you're measuring it in a patient in a pharmacy, that often patients will just walk up to the pharmacy or walk into their medical office, sit down in a chair and have their blood pressure immediately measured. So that lack of a five minute period of rest often results in falsely elevated blood pressure estimations and blood pressure measurements. That's the number one cause for an erroneous blood pressure measurement. Other reasons for a faulty or erroneous blood pressure measurement is improper technique, so not following the proper steps, or it could be faulty equipment. It could be using the wrong cuff size, for example, using too small of a cuff on too large of an arm, or lastly, in hearing the Krakow sounds. To expound on that last one, it's important to actually listen and look for the exact measurement when you first hear the first appearance of a Krakow sounds. That's the systolic blood pressure. And then lastly, to also detect the blood pressure measurement at the absence or the disappearance of the last sound that represents the diastolic blood pressure. If you would like more information, we are putting a link to the website for the Million Hearts Initiative in the description below.